All right, Moors, all meetings are to be open and closed promptly according to the Circle 7 in love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. I want to ask to everyone who is able to to please rise and face the East as we recite the Moorish American prayer, standing facing the East with our heels together so that our feet are at a 45-degree angle, holding up two fingers on the right and five on the left. Please repeat after me. Allah, the Father of the universe, the Father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Allah is my protector, my guide, and my salvation by night and by day through his holy prophet, Drew Ali. Amen. All right, Islam Moors, I want to announce that this meeting is now open. First and foremost, I rise giving the highest of praise to our creator, our father God, Allah. I extend honors to our divine prophet, Noble Drew Ali, for bringing us our divine creed and nationality. I also extend honors to the forerunner to the prophet, Brother Marcus Mosiah Garvey. I extend honors to the Moorish and the American flags, and I extend honors to the Charter and its Ten Wonders. Also, I extend honors to the first appointed Supreme Grand Sheik appointed by the prophet, Brother E. Millie Ill, and I extend honors to all the faithful, all members of the Moorish Science Temple of America. Lastly, I extend honors to the Office of Supreme Grand Sheik and Supreme Grand Council of the Morris Science Temple of America. All right, Morris, uh, we're now going to read our divine constitution and bylaws. All right, here we go. Hang on, Morris. Salvation, Allah, unity. The Morris Science Temple of America, the Divine Constitution and Bylaws, Act 1. The Grand Sheik and the Chairman of the Morris Science Temple of America is empowered to make law and enforce law with the assistance of the Prophet and the Grand Body of the Morris Science Temple of America. The assistant grand sheik is to assist the grand sheik in all affairs if he lives according to love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, and it is known before the members of the Morris Science Temple of America. Act 2. All meetings are to be open and closed promptly according to the Circle 7 and love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Friday is our holy day of rest because on Friday, the first man was formed in flesh, and on Friday, the first man departed out of flesh and ascended unto his father God Allah. For that cause, Friday is a holy day for all Muslims all over the world. Act 3. Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice must be proclaimed and practiced by all members of the Moorish Science Temple of America. No member is to put in danger or accuse falsely his brother or sister on any occasion at all that may harm his brother or sister because Allah is love. Act 4. All members must preserve these holy and divine laws and all members must obey the laws of the government because by being a Moorish American, you are a part and partial of the government and must live the life accordingly. Act 5. This organization of the Moorish Science Temple of America is not to cause any confusion or overthrow the laws of the constitution of the said government, but to obey hereby. Act 6. With us, all members must proclaim their nationality, and we are teaching our people their nationality and their divine creed that they may know that they are a part and partial of this said government and know that they are not Negroes, color folks, black people, or Ethiopians because these names were given to slaves by slaveholders in 1779 and lasted until 1865 during the time of slavery. But this is a new era of time now, and all men now must proclaim their free national name to be recognized by the government in which they live and the nations of the earth. This is the reason why Allah, the great God of the universe, ordained Noble Drew Ali, the prophet, to redeem his people from their sinful ways. The Moorish Americans are the descendants of the ancient Moabites who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa. 
Act 7, all members must promptly attend their meetings and become a part and partial of all uplifting acts of the Morris Science Temple of America. Members must pay their dues and keep in line with the necessities of the Morris Science Temple of America. Then you are entitled to the name faithful. Husband, you must support your wife and children. Wife, you must obey your husband and take care of your children and look after the duties of your household. Sons and daughters must obey father and mother and be industrious and become a part of the uplifting of fallen humanity. All Moorish Americans must keep their hearts and minds pure with love and their bodies clean with water. This divine covenant is from your holy prophet, Noble Drew Ali, through the guidance of his father, God Allah. Noble Drew Ali is the founder, the Moorish American prayer, Allah, father of the universe, father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Allah is my protector, my guide, and my salvation by night and by day through his holy prophet, Drew Ali. Amen. The Morris Science Temple of America, home office of Noble Drew Ali, home office in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Islam, Islam, Islam. All right, Islam and gratitude, sister. <clears throat> uh, Brother Kobe, if you are able to, please read our writs. My grand sheet. Arise, give the praise. Great God, Allah. Arise, give honor to the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. Arise, give honor to the forerunner Mark of Messiah Garvey. Arise, give honor to all ills and bays, all monsters on the call and on the planet. Prophet warns all monsters to be read in every meeting. I hereby inform all members they must end all radical speeches while at work in their homes or on the street. We are for peace and not destruction. Stop flashing your card to Europeans to cause the confusion. Remember, your card is for your salvation. Failure to obey these orders will be a severe consequence. We are for love, truth, peace, freedom. And when these principles are violated, justice must then take its course. Any member or group of members who hold malicious feelings towards the temple or the prophet or violate the divine covenant of the Moors move, receive their rewards from Allah for their unjust deeds. All true Moors will and must obey the law laid down to them by their prophet. If they lose confidence in their prophet, they should turn in their card and button, cease wearing their turban and fez, and return to the state where I, the prophet, found you. This is a holy and divine movement founded by the prophet Noble Jew Ali, and the prophet is not right, the temple is not right. The prophet, therefore, is sending our divine plea to all Moorish Americans. They do their part in protecting their prophet and the temple. This is an everlasting movement founded by the prophet through the will of Allah to redeem his people from their sinful ways. Peace, noble Drew Ali. To the members of the Moorish Science Temple of America, Islam, this is instructions from your prophet, noble Drew Ali. Be faithful unto your forefather, divine and national creed, that you will be blessed for your good deeds that you sow in the flesh. Allah is the one that judges the world, and his judgment is on now. But the weak can comprehend it not. The end of times are drawing near, so says Allah to his divine prophet, I noble Jew Ali. And that is why many hearts have turned to stone. Many have eyes to see, but cannot see. Ears to hear, but cannot hear. At least they'll be confounded of their sins. These are the trying hours now, dear Lord, and every evil spirit is moving, and they are trying every weak mind to overthrow and drag out the true foundation that has been laid and to cause confusion in the minds of the ones that do believe. But if you have the true love of Allah and the spirit of your forefathers, you fear not what you hear or see, but will sacrifice the utmost of your very life to protect your movement and your prophet. Watch your enemies, dear Lord. Your enemies are the ones that speak against your prophet and ridicule him to the very lowest and the ones that speak against your divine and national principles of your temple. Act accordingly, and Allah will bless you for your good work. Peace, your divine prophet, Noble Drew Ali. <laughs> to be proclaimed in every meeting, Islam, I am glad to know I have a few faithful moors among you all, and I desire for them to know the truth and the divine truth. There is a host of jealousy about me and the movement now by the same people of our side of the nation that claimed that I was a joke and unreal. But now, since they found out from the government officials and the nations of the earth that this is the only sole foundation 
that all Asiatics must depend upon for their earthly salvation as American citizens. They are working every scheme that they can to disqualify me so they may take charge of the situation. I have notified all these things to you long ago in the past. It is through the faithful more that attribute to the movement and uplifting funds. The ones that pay their divine respects to me and the movement will be remembered. That is why I'm calling upon all faithful Moors to increase their faithfulness to me, your prophet, and your divine Moors movement. I need finance, and I need it badly. Never before have I need finance so badly as I do at present, so I can shove aside the discord that is facing the nation. It all comes through jealousy because of my fame and nobility. The nations of the world will not recognize the movement without I, the prophet, being head. It has been proven by my work, which I have performed in the past few years. Prophet, Noble Drew Ali. Islam, Islam, Islamism. Happy Sunday School, Ma. Islam and gratitude, brother. Sister Lashay L, would you please read our additional laws? Islam. I rise and give all praise to the great Father God of Allah. I give honors to the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. I give honors to the forerunners of the Prophet Marcus Messiah Garvey. I give honors for all Muslims on the call and all Muslims around the world. Questionary and additional laws for the Moorish Americans by the Prophet Noble Drew Ali. Act 1. Grand Sheiks and Governors and Heads of All Temples, All Business. Each said temple must be approved by the Prophet Noble Drew Ali before acting upon by any members, let it be finance, property, or any line of life that will cause the members to sacrifice finance, ETC, that will cause the support of any group of members. Any formal officer that violates these laws is subject to be removed from his office under a heavy restriction, ETC, by the prophet or the grand sheet. Act two. All members are to attend their EDEP meetings and their public meetings promptly. If a member is found standing around on the meeting period, she'll be fined 50 cents on the first case. And on the second, he will be fined $1, which will go on your emergency fund. If a member is working, his monthly dues must be paid. And if he has money in the bank, he must subscribe for as much as he is able to finance to uplift the nation. Act 3. It is the lawful and divine duty of every good member, if he is able in finance, to aid me in saving the nation. And if he does not, he's an enemy to the cause of uplifting his own people, and justice must catch you. Let it be he or she according to love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, as I have the power invested in my hands, and I would have to enforce the law in order to save the nation. Act 4. All members while up making a public speech must not use any assertion against the American flag or speak radical against the church or any member of any organized group, because we're to teach love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Act five, all members must promptly attend their meetings and send their children to Sunday school. And the teacher must confirm himself to the questionnaire and let every member exercise his five senses who is able to do so, because out from your Sunday school comes the guidance of the nation. Act six, with us, all members must proclaim their nationality and we're teaching our people their nationality in their divine creed that they may know that they are a part and parcel of this said government and know that they're not Negroes, colored folks, black people, or Ethiopians, because these names are given to slaves by slaveholders in 1779 and lasted until 1865 during the time of slavery. But this is a new era of time now, and all men now must proclaim their free national name to be recognized by the government in which they live in the nations of the earth. This is the reason why Allah, the great God of the universe, ordained Noble Drew Ali, the prophet, to redeem his people from their sinful ways. The Moorish Americans are the descendants of the ancient Moabites who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa. Act 7. All members must properly attend their meetings and become a part and a parcel of all uplifting acts of the Moorish Science Temple. Members must pay their dues and keep in mind with all necessities of the Moorish Science Temple then you are entitled to the name of faithful. Husband, you must support your wife and children. Wife, you must obey your husband and take care of your children and look after the duties of your household. Sons and daughters must obey father and mother and be industrious and become part of the uplifting of falling humanity. All Moorish Americans must keep their hearts and mind pure with love and their bodies clean with water. This divine covenant is from your holy prophet, Noble Ali, through the guidance of his father God, Allah. 
Slime. Gratitude, sister. <clears throat> okay. Um, before we start off, just want to ask a few things or announce a few things. Um, it looks like our next physical meeting is not going to be until November, and that looks like uh, November 24th. We're actually we're going to have a giveaway, a food giveaway, and that will be at the Reynoldsburg Library. That's in Columbus, Ohio, uh, November 24th. Um, also, I um, wanted to share the link for our our um, our Telegram group chat. If you're not already a member of, of our, our Telegram, make sure to to save that link. Use that link to join the chat room. You have to get that link to join. Um, so we'll be having our next Holy Day meeting on Telegram. Uh, Brother Davis L. is going to be chairing that meeting. So that'll be next this upcoming Friday, the 27th, and that will be on Telegram. OK, and then also I wanted to ask um, about convention um, for the uh, the unity temples. It's going to be. October 15th through the 20th. I was just asking why we have everybody on here. Was anybody planning on um, making that trip to Chicago, the Mecca for the uh, convention? Anybody is here in the meeting. Islam, uh, I plan on Islam, brother. Do you know what days you're going to be there yet? Okay, yeah, your your mic's real low. It sounded like you said Wednesday. Oh, that's long. I apologize. I had to get closer to the speaker. Uh, I'll be getting to Mecca Tuesday night, like around 10 o'clock on the 15th. So I'll be able to attend everything from Wednesday to Sunday. Um, and then Sunday, I'll leave, I'll leave out at around 6, 18 at night. It's long. All right, Islam. Yeah, it looks like we're we're not gonna be able to get out there until closer to the weekend. So um that's either Thursday or Friday, the either the seventeenth or eighteenth, you know, and then leaving on the twentieth. So okay, but yeah, just trying to check and see, you know, who who all is planning on going out there so we could um link up while we're out there. Um if anybody else thinks they wanna go, uh just let me know on the side if you're not sure right now. In Islam, also, I got the address uh, for the simple one as well. I believe all members, uh, the form of uh, $35 to be presented uh, whenever, whenever anybody goes to the convention or gets there. Islam. All right, Islam, if you don't mind, shit, would you please share that info in the chat? All right. And then, too, everybody remember, I just put the link in the chat for that, the, our Telegram. Uh, group chat make sure to click that link um if you don't have telegram go you know install that app it's free and um use that link to join our our group chat and that's that's where our next holy day meeting is going to be uh we'll resume it on zoom after that but it's going to be on on telegram next friday all right and let's go ahead and go into the holy quran well the quran questionnaire Today, we're in the Quran questionnaire. We're going over questions 30 through 34, uh, just focusing on those few questions. And we will go ahead and start now. Uh, so um, instead of just, you know, going through the questions and just reading them back, trying to memorize them, want to have understanding on them. And today, I just want to go over these questions um, from a spiritual and a historical perspective. And um, the spiritual perspective gives us understanding that we can use in our daily lives or makes it relevant to our daily lives. So hopefully, you know, uh, we'll all gain a deeper understanding on this connection 
that's being made here between the Moabites and the Moroccans and um, the significance of these connections spiritually and historically. Right. And um, we'll all understand how it's relevant to our daily lives. We're in the Quran questionnaire for Morris America's questions 30 through 34. We're going to speak about the historical context, the spiritual insights and connect this back to the teachings of Prophet Noble Drew Ali. So just going over them, question 30, what is the nationality of Ruth? Ruth was a Moabitess. What is the modern name for the Moabites? Moroccans. Where's the Moroccan empire? Northwest of Mexico. What is the modern name for Mexico? Africa. What is the title given to our ruler in Morocco? Sultan. So even with some of these questions, seems like they're left ambiguous. And I wanted to speak on that because I believe that's done for a reason. All right. So, um, you know, the prophet in here connects us to the Moabites and the Moroccans. He taught that understanding our ancient roots gives us a spiritual anchor. It gives us a sense of national identity. And this is what aids us in uplifting fallen humanity. So he reconnected us to the Moabites and the Moroccans to remind us of our noble lineage and to empower us with the tools to reclaim our divine birthright. Okay? So I'm just I'm going to break this up into two parts, like questions 30 through 32, then 33 and 34. And um, also, like I said, we want to talk about it from the spiritual, like a deeper, more metaphysical meaning, and then also the historical significance. So going to question 30, what was the nationality of Ruth? Ruth was a Moabitess. Looking at this, uh, gratitude, brother. Looking at this from a spiritual perspective, right? Ruth is a Moabitess. She represents loyalty, faithfulness, and divine connection through lineage. From a metaphysical perspective, Moab represents the material or carnal mind. Ruth's journey symbolizes the soul's transformation through spiritual alignment and redemption. Let's see if we could put these up on the screen on this whiteboard. Okay. Yeah, so pardon. Let, let me see if we can get this whiteboard up here. I'm going to put this up here. Um, so we want to talk about this in a way that this applies to all of us. Okay. Okay, let me try that again. All right. And uh hold on. Uh hopefully everybody can see this. Okay, so um, looking at this, right, metaphysically, Moab represents, and remember this, uh, Moab represents the material or carnal mind. Remember this, okay? Ruth's journey does symbolize um, the soul's transformation through spiritual alignment and also through redemption. When we look into Charles uh, Fillmore's Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, another good resource for understanding the scripture, it explains that Ruth's story as a journey of spiritual um, devotion and faith, right? Her marriage into Israel symbolizes a unification of the material and spiritual realms. This is important to know because, you know, who knows that Moab represents the carnal mind? This is a way of looking at the scriptures and understanding what's really being told to us, what's really being said, but not being said outright. You know, in many ways, it's hidden in our faces, right? Because um, 
Well, because that's how they did with the scriptures. They didn't just come right out and say everything because they feel like if people aren't going to take the time to understand and learn what it really means, maybe they ain't ready for the jewels that's in there. Okay, so this means that Moab also, instead, in, in, as well as being a physical place in the past, it also represents the material or carnal mind. Israel representing a um, spiritually elevated state. And so her marriage, right, with Boaz, this symbolizes the unification, right, coming into Israel. So unifying the material and the spiritual realms. And this is a reminder for all of us now. Now, this part isn't in the metaphysical Bible dictionary, but this is telling us why the prophet brought this to us. Why he why did he use this specific character from the Bible? Because all these characters in the Bible, whether it's a human, whether it's a mountain, whether it's an enemy or a friend, it's all states of our own consciousness. So this is being brought to us because it's a reminder to all of us that through loyalty to divine principles, we can transcend our own material limitations. This is what the prophet wants us all to understand. Loyalty to divine principles is why he brought us these divine principles, right? Just, you know, to live by. Through loyalty to that, we can transcend our material limitations. And this is something that applies to all of us that should be at the forefront of all, our, all, um, all of our minds and whatever we do. Now, historically, Ruth is significant because her story connects the Moabites to the lineage of King David. And through that, ultimately, due to the Messiah, Jesus. Right? Or the, you know, the prophet Jesus. And that ties us back to, you know, this ties all Moorish Americans, right? As the prophet Noble Drew Ali, um, you know, divinely returned this or brought this information to us. It reconnects us to the ancient Moabites so that we can assert our rightful place in history, right? We're now, we descendants of a noble people with spiritual significance. So this, this significance is for us to understand and know, to realize our great potential. Okay, and then um, moving on to question 31. Hey, right, there's one more. Uh, so 31, what is the modern name for the Moabites? Okay. All right. The modern name for the Moabites is Moroccans. So looking at Morocco, spiritually, um, representing the modern Moabites. This is a symbol of our divine continuity and endurance. Prophet Noble Drew Ali once again highlighted this connection on one hand to instill pride in us, a sense of pride in our own ancient heritage and spiritually helping us to understand that our identity is not limited to by time because you're talking about going back thousands of years. So it's not limited by time or geography, right? Even which part of the world that we're in. It transcends material limitations and it's linking us to an ancient wisdom that informs us, uh, uh, you know, of who we are in the present, right? Because you can't change our descent nature, right? Unless your powers extend beyond the great God. So we understand that we're, we're connected to this, regardless of what's happened, what we've gone through. This can't be changed. No one can undo this. Historically, the Moabites were a Semitic people, and um, they were located east of the Jordan River, right? They were actually in the Levant. The Levant is like uh, Jordan and Israel, modern-day Israel. I think two other places, too, that I can't remember right now. But it puts us, actually, it, it connects us to these people, right? And those descendants later became connected to the Moroccan Empire. Why? Because historically, those people who were in that area that you would now call like the Middle East, I guess, the, that's on the coast of the Mediterranean, 
they really did travel down and settle in North Africa, just as the prophet taught us. So they later became connected to the Moroccan Empire. Right in Morocco is a prominent kingdom in Northwest Africa. It's one of the lasting symbols of the Moorish grandeur, the Moorish um, sovereignty, and reflecting the influence of our ancestors in world history. Even when you go to Morocco today, you can still see some of the palaces and amazing things that Moors created. Just like when you go to Spain today, in Granada, you can see some of it. And it's amazing because the things that the Moors created 2,000 years ago have a huge impact on society today. There would be no universities if it weren't for those Moors who later settled in Spain. There would be no... I mean, there's so many things we could take away. They had they had paved streets with, you know, they, they were lit up at night, right? There's just so much, right, that they contributed to society. And I'm just saying, like, you can still see that stuff in Morocco today, right? And they've been keeping it going now, now for thousands of years, right, dating back. And we're connected to that. And so this understanding now serves as a basis for reclaiming our own national identity. Moving on to question um, 32, where is the Moroccan empire? This is another one, it's like, okay, what, what's this really saying? Where's the Moroccan empire? Northwest of Mexum. What does that mean? A Mexum, right, also referred to as Africa, that's what we're, we're taught, holds spiritual significance for us and for others as well, because this is the ancient land of our our forefathers, the name of Mexum, right? It reminds us that we are spiritually connected to this sacred land, right? This huge amount of land is vast. And this place also represents the womb of humanity and civilization. There's really two places like that um, that's known, or at least is taught. One is in the... Um, what they call now North Africa. Okay. So it's a place of great historical and divine wisdom. And then hang on. Uh, okay. And then um, also historically, right? So we understand a Mexican refers to the ancient lands that's now known as Africa. This name. It's been forgotten or hasn't been used in a while. It's been returned to us. Um, and particularly referring to the northern regions, including Morocco and the surrounding territories. Uh, the Moroccan Empire's uh, influence stretched across these lands, reflecting Moorish control over trade, over knowledge and spiritual practices. So for us, reclaiming our identity, our, our identity as Moors, right, as we come in and do this now, we're reclaiming the legacy of the Moroccan Empire. And so not only was that a political force, but it was also a center of learning. It was also a center of, of learning, of culture, and of spirituality. So we're going and we're, we're reconnecting to this, right? So just um, recapping this, just 30 through 32, just want to uh, go back to this. So Ruth, Ruth being a Moabitess, we spoke on how Ruth's story, while, you know, you can look at it from the biblical or the historical perspective, we also know that there's a metaphysical or spiritual perspective that applies to everyone. Anyone in the world can use, you know, the scriptures to apply it to their everyday life if they're looking at the spiritual meaning, the hidden meaning. So Ruth's story as found in the Bible and also referred to in the Quran questionnaire, this is representing profound spiritual wisdom. Ruth was a Moabitess, and, and uh, Ruth as the Moabitess symbolized devotion, loyalty, and divine alignment. This is what her story, right, the scriptures tell. Devotion, loyalty, and divine alignment. So these are the main things you can get from that story. Then her nationality as a Moabitess connects her directly to the Moabites who are linked to the carnal or material consciousness 
in the metaphysical teachings. Okay, spiritually, this doesn't mean that all oh, the Moabites they were just all carnal, they were just all physical. No, this is saying you know spiritually. This is what it also represents when you're talking about this nation. So in the scriptures, also it's linked to the carnal or the material consciousness. But also, okay, in that story, Ruth transcends her material origins by choosing to follow a higher spiritual path. So when she marries. Boaz, right? She she um she unifies with a higher vibratory rate or a higher um way of living, a higher mind state. So um and that's once again going back to Charles Fillmore's metaphysical Bible dictionary. The Moabites symbolize the carnal mind. So Ruth's decision to leave Moab and align herself with the God of Israel is symbolic of a higher divine consciousness, and that's the journey of the soul transcending these lower desires and the attachments to do what? To reach spiritual fulfillment. So this is something that's for all of us. Ruth's devotion to Naomi and then her acceptance of this new spiritual identity that reflects the process that we're all going through of self-purification and dedication to higher truths. And that is, that's at the center of the teachings that the prophet brought to us. Right? Isn't that at the center of the Morris Science Temple of America's teachings? It's, it's, it's at the center of it all. So understand that just in that Ruth, the Moabitess, right? This is, this is giving us an understanding of, you know, what we're all about, right? Self-purification, dedication to higher truths. This is what we're really about. And then everything that we now create, everything that we do, whether it's now or in the future, it's going to be from our higher self. So we're not going to continue the, the corruption and the things that's going on in this world. And this is why, you know, when we see, you know, our own people, more is doing this stuff that refuse to accept the, the work to subdue their lower self. It is a problem. It is an issue. It's not something that we can just overlook. We're not trying to just continue what's going on right now. The same corruption, the same problems. We're not trying to just repeat the same stuff all over again. We've already been through this stuff thousands and thousands of times. We already been through it. We don't need any more people molesting children. Gone somewhere with that mess. It's been done so many times. It, it, we're done with that. We don't need any more people, you know, you know, robbing and killing each other in all this ignorance and foolishness. We're done with that. We're coming to create something bigger and better. So, yes, it's a problem when you have Moors, especially claiming to be Moors, especially that want to align themselves with the prophet in some kind of way. And they don't want to do no work on themselves. It's a problem. We're not standing for it. Just reinforcing this because this is what the prophet brought to us. Now, those are my words. That's how I'm. Um, this is how I understand what the prophet brought. He's given us the teachings to bring out our higher self. And showing us to create everything from the higher self. That's what we're really about. It's at the center of everything that we do. We don't leave out our divine principles in anything that we do. So for Moorish Americans, this transformation that Ruth goes through, it signifies that no matter where we begin in our material lives, we have the capacity to transcend any worldly limitations that we, that we align ourselves with. We, we can change all of that by aligning ourselves with divine will, raising our thoughts to divine wisdom. And so the journey of faith and loyalty that's mirrored by Ruth, that's a lesson in persistence and spiritual evolution. This is something that can be applied to all of us, right? But you have to want it. You can't give this to somebody. People have to want it. They have to want to better themselves, all right? And so just, you know, speaking on that, right? Uh, we spoke on the historical perspective, how it ties in 
you know, back to Jesus, right? And this is being applied to us as Moorish Americans. So what the prophet brought to us, right, is significant hey, because hey. those Islam, somebody can, can you mute your mic? Right, so um, this reconnects us to the Moabites. They were descended from Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. Just that on it in, in and of itself, connecting you back in the, the Abrahamic lineage, but then also being linked into other significant biblical features, uh, figures, because um, of Ruth's marriage to Boaz, right? Boaz was a man of Judah. And this led to the birth of Obed, who was the grandfather of King David. So once again, that intertwines us in with this lineage then this lineage ultimately led to jesus okay so just from that you know for us as moorish americans to understand that connects us to a sacred noble ancestry that includes spiritual and royal heritage okay right so you have the connection between moab and the lineage of king david all right so that's you know for us um it's important to understand we have a a, a noble status or we're reclaiming a noble status and also not just the noble status, but also a spiritual authority. And this is important. We're going to speak on this a little bit later too. You're talking about the whole Sultan thing, right? But this, this reconnects us to a noble status and a spiritual loyalty, royalty, right? I mean, <laughs> loyalty. I keep saying the wrong word. I'm going to say spiritual authority. I don't know what's going on. All right. Royal, royal lineage and um, spiritual authority. That's important to know, too. So in our current state, if we're not even trying to have control over ourselves, we don't want to control our lower self. We ain't no spiritual authority. We can't be spiritual authority if we can't even control ourselves. You know, but ultimately, that's what the prophet is setting us up to be. We have to follow these divine truths. We have to be faithful to it. All right. This is what a lot of the world is suffering from, regardless of what religion or philosophy, way of life people have. If they're not really trying to control themselves, they can't be any type of spiritual authority. And this is why you have some of the churches that are like, you know, pretty much looking the other way while they're, you know, they have problems like with the priest in the, uh, the Catholic Church, what they're doing to what they've been doing. Not all of them, right? Not trying to condemn the whole Catholic Church, but what a lot of them have been, what's been going on is just been getting covered up. I don't even want to speak that stuff out loud because it's, it's horrible, right? But this is what happens when you have people claiming this authority and they're not even getting right. So we're here to do it for real. All right. So I'm moving on. Question 31. Just going back over this modern name for the Moabites being Moroccans, that modern term, right? That's the modern term for Moabites. Um, and this is connecting us. Or This is a bridge to ancient wisdom with the modern identity. So the Moabites, right, we, we've, you know, just spoke on how that represents spiritually the carnal mind. OK. And then with the with the story of Ruth, the Moabites, it's the carnal mind that has been transformed through devotion to the divine. And us, right, as the Moroccans, we symbolize the continuation of that ancient consciousness, right, transforming it. And so, and this is something that we have to do as a people. We can't continue in the current state that we're in. We have to clean ourselves up. We have to be better. And especially if you look at society as a whole, in 2024, 2025, 2026, it's just, it's, it's bad. It's going down. It's getting worse. There's more and more confusion is being spread and more dysfunction. And it's not sustainable. It's bad. It's, you know, it's bad for everyone involved, men, women, and children. And so we have to be transformed. We have to accept this spiritual, um, work that we must do on ourselves. So in a spiritual context or metaphysical context, Morocco is the grounding of these spiritual principles into a sovereign nation. The spiritual lineage of the Moabites, right, as a people 
who have transcended materiality through their divine connection. This is continuing in this Moroccan identity. And that's significant because the Moors represent the enlightened mind. And it's the enlightened mind grounded in spiritual authority and wisdom. And this is what's emphasized in all the teachings that the prophet brought to us. It's not about, you know, just acting like we know something, acting like we're better than anyone. We don't even do that. We're not even supposed to be looking down on anyone else, regardless of what their, you know, beliefs are. We're supposed to be looking for the commonality in it. But, um, right, this is significant for us, right? So understanding our spiritual lineage, right, is being connected to the Moabites. This is teaching us that we are inheritors of a, a rich spiritual tradition. And it calls us to higher consciousness, right? So with higher consciousness, integrity, and alignment with divine law. And so whereas nowadays you have people like, and it's not even a nowadays thing because they was doing this stuff when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, making it cool to be dumb. It's cool to be ignorant. It's cool to be a criminal. It's cool to be untrustworthy. It's cool to be violent. It's cool to be nasty and foul. And it's just getting worse, right? You um, you, you know, just like it, it's getting worse and worse now, it's cool to be a drug addict, right? It's cool to be perverted and messed up in the head. And so this is how far as a people we had to fall so that when we transcend this, when we transform and become something greater and begin to resemble the, the creator, when we begin to resemble a lot, when people see us as angels, that changes everything. That's how we uplift fallen humanity. This wasn't just being told to us as just words to say. Like, people don't take this seriously. They don't think any of this is real. Even though when this man, the prophet, brought this to us, nobody was talking like this. It, it, you know, you had these little new thought movements and stuff going on, but nobody was bringing it to us. And plus, we still had some sense back then in the 1920s. Men weren't walking around with their whole underwear showing, thinking it's cool. We know that comes from homosexual prison culture. Why would any man want to want to propagate that like it's cool and still try to act like a day a man? I'm a man. You 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 think it's cool to do this. So we have to fall that low so that when we transform, the whole world takes notice like, oh, wow, let me see what they're doing. That's how we begin to uplift fallen humanity. It's not by anything we say. It's not by a bunch of YouTube videos post on TikTok and all this stupid mess. We can stop doing all of that stuff. It's about the, the actual deeds that we do, how we actually live our lives, right? You got people that got like thousands of views, millions of views, and they putting out videos and they not even raising their own children, right? Talking about you a more, I'm a noble. Noble this, this, and that. The dude turn around and his underwear is showing. Nobody wants to see that, right? So we have fallen. And it's about transforming, transcending that, becoming something greater, not just in thought, I mean, in talk, because that's the other thing. People want to talk up themselves like they're so great, want to give us, I'm the sultan, I'm this, this, and that. I'm, I got all these great names and overcompensating. It's not about anything that we say. It's about how we're actually living, man. We can't keep with this foolishness and act like we really going to do something great. Because no change is going to come because the people are content. Everybody is content. As long as people have their whatever shows they watching, video games or weed or, or, or liquor or whatever it is people like to do, they are content. Ain't nobody trying to change nothing. Okay? People weren't trying to change things 30, 40 years ago. Nobody was teaching us this stuff as children. They weren't trying to change nothing. They were content. And they knew even back then that the system that we have, the religion that we have, all this stuff was forced on us. They weren't trying to change any of that. People are content. So nothing is going to truly change until we change ourselves. All right. Everything that we do or try to do, and we're doing it halfway. 
We're not putting our all into it. So this is why we can't leave out the work, the actual spiritual work that we have to do to bring out the greater form of ourselves. Stop trying to do it just from the carnal lower self. It just even in who we are as being Moorish Americans, being descendants of the ancient Moabites, spiritually, this mean, this is a reminder, right? That through loyalty to our divine principles, we can transcend any limitations. Nothing can stop us, but we have to buy in. We're going to have to change some things and be greater. Greater than even we think we could be. And so the prophet put that in there to remind us, hey, by reclaiming this identity of who we are, this is a whole process that we go through of spiritual awakening and renewal. All right. And then by understanding this right now, our spiritual lineage is is connected. Now we are inheritors of a rich spiritual tradition. And this brings us into higher consciousness. Now we have the integrity and alignment with divine law. Now nothing we do can be stopped. And then also, yes, it's going to uplift fallen humanity because people are going to be able to see, oh, wow, they are for real. They're not just calling themselves. You, people, you know, might think, oh, the people in Morocco, they don't like us. They think we're frauds. Who cares? If that, if people, when people see us actually be who we're supposed to be, they're going to have to respect it. It might even cause them to want to change and be better too. And there ain't going to be no calling us frauds or saying anything negative about us. All right. And then technically, if we stuck in our lower selves and still doing the same stuff we doing, we are frauds because the prophet didn't bring any of that. He was hard on the Moors. He went, he traveled through the South where Moors were being lynched. And he said, it is, it is your fault this is happening. You are slaves to sin. You, you want to follow behind the Europeans. They lynching you and you want to be the same religion as them. They, they, you know, trying to tear up everything that you have and you're trying to make your hair look like them. He's like, what is wrong with you? So, you know, and that might be harsh to tell people, but hey, it's the truth, ain't it? The truth hurts. So um, historically, though, the Moabites were in that region and, and, you know, on the on the banks of the Mediterranean, what is now called Jordan. And they and said they actually did move um, out of that region into the northwest Africa. So they are technically they did become the Moroccans. And Morocco in the past wasn't limited to just modern day um, the nation of Morocco. Right. In the past, you're talking about everything from Western Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, all the way to Mauritania. You know, parts of Mali, maybe even Senegal as well. All right. So Mor Morocco, though, is, you know, as a modern nation, is still a powerful um, modern continuation of the Moabite people. Right. But remember, in the past, the Moors ruled large parts of not just North Africa, but also Spain, right? Al-Andalus, okay? And so they're the descendants of those ancient peoples, right? The Moabites. And in that, in that term, Moor itself, is it was used in a, a broad sense to describe the people of North Africa and especially those connected to the powerful Moroccan empire. And Prophet Noble Drali reclaimed this heritage Right. By declaring that the modern descendants of the Moabites are the Moroccans. And so doing that, he established that Moorish Americans are not just a people disconnected from their history, but we're the inheritors of a legacy that extends back to the Moabites and the Moroccans and who were rulers of great empires. And so that Moroccan identity, right, being ascribed to the, those Moabites, that highlights that evolution from this ancient biblical people into the builders of, of um, one of the most significant Islamic and African civilizations, right? They, they civilized much of the world. Europe wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for the Moors. And that's not necessarily a bad thing since our empires fell, right? If we were gonna, if it's destined 
that we were going to fall to the European nations, it's good that they got civilized because they didn't. That means that we will be in even worse conditions if we're going to be under those people, if they were going to conquer some of our um, civilizations. Right. So, um, but this is just a, it's a reminder of our heritage, our noble heritage. And then it goes back thousands of years. And it's a legacy of, of leadership and, and spiritual wisdom and cultural richness. Right. And we're tied into that. And so that's going into question 32. Where is the Moroccan empire? Okay. And we have that as Northwest of Mexico. What does that even mean? Hang on. Oh man, I didn't mean to do that. But um Okay, so uh All right, so on one hand, northwest of Mexico um with the prophets obviously talking about North Africa, right? He explains that in here, but it also goes deeper than that. Right? So from a spiritual perspective, right? A Mexum, at least how it's presented to us, is not just a geographical location. This is also a spiritual homeland. Okay? So it's not just, there's not just one way to look at things. And you're going to see this a lot. It's, it's not just one way to understand things, especially if you want to get real, um, real insight, real wisdom from whatever scriptures that you're reading. Right? So for us, it's also... Um, it's a spiritual homeland. This is a place where divine wisdom, knowledge, and uh, civilization was established, founded. It's also revealed that the term refers to Africa, particularly that Northwest region. And this is where the ancient civilizations flourished. All right. Um, where you have that whole Sahara Desert, right? This huge, gigantic desert that's larger than entire nations, right? That that place is actually so old, it used to be a sea. That whole area, all that sand, that's where a, a gigantic sea was. But even before that, you had actually actual civilizations that covered up that whole area. So just saying that this goes back really far. It goes back very far. Okay. Um, farther even than it's given credit for. All right, pardon. So um, just going back to this again, a maximum light, it symbolizes our divine inheritance, right? And the divine inheritance of humanity and also the birthplace of civilization. Because this is also, I would say, one of the places where civilization was birthed, but we're going to speak on that in a deeper way too, right? So reclaiming our identity, right, as part of this empire is symbolic of us reclaiming our divine birthright, right? And this Northwest of Mexum is where the spiritual truths were encoded into law, into culture, and also into governance. So this is reminding us we're not lost. We're returning to our own status as enlightened beings. We have our own way of understanding things. We have our own name for these places. Everybody else has their own names, right? Their own understanding, their own philosophy, and so do we. Oh, that's Africa. Yeah, we know it's Africa, but this, this is a maxim. All right? And then um, we're not lost. So we're deeply connected to the divine through our ancestral heritage, and um, which some people thought they cut us off from it. And then going back historically, so Northwest Africa um, or Northwest of Mexum, right? This is referring to Northwest Africa, and it's covering the regions of modern-day which you could actually see up here on the screen, modern day Morocco. You got Morocco up here. You got Algeria up here in the orange. You got Mauritania up here in the gray. You got Tunisia up here in the blue, green, whatever. All right. And that was the heart of the Moorish empire. And this civilization was known for its contributions to science, to mathematics, to architecture, to governance, right? Creating government and this, the same things that governments build off of today. It was influenced by what was going on here. And this cannot be disputed at all. Okay. And these people were actually ruling for a long time. 
right? The story they give us about the slave trade, when you really dig into history, you find out that these various European nations and even the early <laughs> United States colony was paying tribute to all to the rulers in all of these places at once. They got to make a trip to Morocco, pay the sultan. Then they got to go to Algeria. Then they got to go to Tunisia. They got to go to Tripoli, Libya, right? They got to go to all these places to drop off payments to them. And this was them in their downfall. But just saying that they were ruling the world. They were ruling the seas, at least. Okay? But um, so it was a powerful force in the world. And especially during the medieval period, because the Moors ruled large parts of Europe, most notably Spain, which was Al-Andalus, but also the Moors were in Italy, pretty much everywhere around there. And they had been in there since way before those places had those names, right? Because even going back to the Phoenicians, they were ruling those places. And the Phoenicians wound up becoming the Moroccans. All right? But a Mexum also has a broader significance for us because the prophet Noble Drew Ali taught that a Mexum not only includes Africa, but also extends to North America. It extends to North America. And in that understanding <laughs> is, is um, brought to us because the Moors, as an ancient people, had a presence in the Americas long before European colonization. And so understanding this, now with this connection that the prophet brought back to us, now we can actually trace ourselves over here. Now, when we see that, oh, they found Venetian coins over here. Oh, they got all of these different landmarks and tablets with the Phoenician language on it all throughout the Americas from Argentina, Brazil, all the way up through um, New England, like in New Hampshire and Connecticut and even up in Minnesota, all these different places. Now we can see, oh, this is what the prophet was talking about. Oh, this is why we don't go against the prophet. He really was speaking about our people being here. We were, we had trade going on. So when you're seeing like the, in the Great Lakes, you'll see some of these alternative histories where they're showing that the indigenous people were mining copper and all types of um, material and metal in that Great Lakes region. It's like, you know, that was our people. And they were trading all over the world. They were civilized. But it's only through being reconnected to who we are. So the with the prophet connected us to, like, okay, yeah, we're indigenous to this land. But guess what? Our history is deeply rooted in both Africa and America. Why would we try to go against that? It connects us. So the prophet identified Northwest of Mexico with both Northwest Africa and North America. That's why it's ambiguous in here. Because we're connected. And you see that in how it's spoken of in the Quran. When you go to chapter 47. Speaking about Africa, okay. The Moabites from the land of Moab, right? They received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa. They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan empire with their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. So you have these people that are in North Africa today or in different parts of Africa, right? And they can claim who they are, but then it says their dominion and inhabitation extended from Northeast and Southwest Africa, across the great Atlantis, even into the present North, South and Central America, and also Mexico and the Atlantis islands before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic ocean. This lets us know that those Moabites, right? With their Canaanite, Hittite and Amorite brethren who came over here, they're also the true possessors of the present Moroccan empire. But what do they have to do? They have to come in and reclaim who they are. That's it. We don't have to ask anyone's permission. We won't have to file a bunch of paperwork with the government. That stuff means nothing if we're not actually moving as these people for real. It carries no weight. So all we have to do is come back into who we are for real. Right? 
and we're reconnected. And now that's the modern Moroccan empire. Now we're reconnected. Now this is Northwest of Mexico. We don't say that that's not Northwest of Mexico because obviously it is. They reestablished themselves. Their lands got colonized by Europeans. They came through trying to set up their own nation states and try to reconnect with their own identity. All right. And we have to do the same thing over here. Okay. And over there, they have the same problem too. They have ones who, you know, don't want to, you know, who want to follow after the ways of Europeans and other people who aren't theirs, aren't looking out for their own people. But then they also have their own people who are about reconnecting with their own ways. And so we have to do the same thing over here, right? So now the prophet is linked the Moorish Americans in with a vast and a noble heritage, right? Because it's huge, it's vast, and it spans continents. That's why it's like you're seeing the people, they want to, oh, this is just over here. And they want to claim it like this is the real, you know, old land and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, cool, yeah, do you. But the prophet reconnected us to all of this. We're not limited. So we have a dual identification, right? Because a Mexum emphasizes that Moorish presence and the sovereignty that these people had on both sides of the Atlantic. So it's reinforcing this idea that we're part of a global legacy, a global legacy. And that legacy includes civilization, the creators of civilization, culture, um, you know, higher learning, spiritual wisdom, all of that. And the prophet really did reconnect us to that. He didn't come in and say, oh, y'all stuck over here by yourselves. You know, it's it's just y'all, you know, you know, forget everybody else. No. What's the divine origin of the Asiatic nation saying? It's connecting us pretty much to everybody in the world. It's not saying go run your mouth talking about the Egyptians over there aren't the real Egyptians. It doesn't say that. Right. It doesn't say, you know, we. We against the Chinese and the Japanese. Why would we be? The, why would we even think to say anything like that? You see what it says in chapter forty-five: the Hindus of India, the Asiatic nations of North, South, and Central America, the Moorish Americans and Mexicans of North America, Brazilians, Argentinians, and Chileans of South America. Right. So we're connected. We're you know, we're we're not against any of these people, right? I mean, we're, we're not against anyone. We're not like, you know, we practice love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. But just saying, right, these are our cousins. These are our people, too. So we've been linked back into something. We're not limited to just Tennessee, right? We had, because when you think about it, what was it about the Moors? They had a global civilization. All right. They expanded throughout the continents to the point where, OK, if you <clears throat> were over here in the Americas, you could have went over to Europe, especially in Spain, and you would have been right at home. <clears throat> you could have went into North Africa. Same thing. Right. And even to the point when it spread to the Philippines and other parts like that, you would have been right at home in all of these places. So we are reconnected into something that's greater than that, right? And so just, just wanted to share that, just, you know, some more insight into this, like from a spiritual perspective that applies to us, Ruth's transformation from a Moabitess to an ancestor of King David. This is inspiring all of us because we know that Moab symbolizes just symbolically, spiritually, not physically, just spiritually symbolizes the carnal mind and the marriage of that with Israel symbolizes, you know, growing from being in that carnal mindset to a higher spiritual divine mindset. This is something that we all base um, our, our lives off of so that everything we do is from our higher self. So for us identifying with the Moabites and Moroccans, like, you know, spiritually, historically, we can see ourselves, you know, how this affects us, right? How we are in this modern world where we've fallen, you know, even in the prophet's time, even though our people had fallen, they still, you know, most for the most part, they knew to take care of their children. They knew, you know, that I show those black and white pictures all the time. You saw the couples when they go out, they dress nice. They didn't go outside their underwear showing. 
right? So we had to fall a little lower. Why? So that we, when we transform ourselves, we not only affect ourselves, but we also affect other people as well in a positive manner. Whereas right now, you know, you got the people putting out music, they influencing people to pop pills and do all this stupid mess, right? You know, the female rap, they, they influencing women to be whores, to be nasty and stupid, right? So we, you know, we, we're going to use our powers for good now. Okay. And so understanding that too, Northwest, Northwest of Mexico, that's including Northwest Africa and North America. It's including it. Right. So, you know, we, we could see it from a, from a, a greater perspective. Then going to question 33, what is the modern name for a Mexum? Africa, right? So Africa is more than just the geographical location. Spoke on this a second ago. Also seen as the spiritual birthplace of humanity. Spiritually, okay? We know what spiritual means. It's not physical. So our connection to Africa or Mexum is representing, for us, it's our return to our divine origin. Right? Because man is neither the body nor the soul. We are spirit and one with the law. All right, so we are reawakening into this spiritual knowledge, right? And it's embedded in the land. So now by recognizing this, we can come to realize our spiritual journey. And it, it mirrors that journey that all of humanity is going through, right? We're seeking this return to a divine harmony, right? Our true nature, the truth, the only truth. All right. Also, historically, Africa has been known as a cradle of civilization, or at least one of them. Right. And that term, just a Mexum in and of itself, a Mexum and in Africa, in America, you can see that America is a mix of the words a Mexum and Africa. You know, you just take the A-M-E from a Mexum and you take the R-I-C-A from Africa. And you got America. So it's not a coincidence. None of this stuff is coincidence. None of it. Okay. So this is the, you know, reestablishing of our identity now under the teachings of the prophet noble Drew Ali. This is what helps us to reclaim the, the narrative, right? Of Africa is the land of kings, scholars, right? Spiritual teachers, um, you know, the first scholars, the first teachers long before colonization. And we understand from our perspective as Moorish Americans, this is Northwest Africa. All right, that's our understanding. This is Northwest of Mexico, Northwest Africa. Going to question 34. What is the title given to our ruler in Morocco, Sultan? The term Sultan is, um, that signifies one who holds authority but not only in the material world, also spiritually. So the Sultan is a priest king. And we've read this over and over again, right? I went to that Manly P. Hall book, Manly P. Hall, honorary master Mason, who wrote all of these spiritual metaphysical books about um, masonry and history and everything. And he was speaking about how the ancestors in Egypt the ancient, ancient, like several, several thousands of years old civilization, they always had a priest king who was surrounded by a priesthood. Priesthood maintained them, they protected them, they advised them. <clears throat> and so the king had to represent duality, right? He had to exercise mastery over his or her lower self and also unity with the higher self. It wasn't just about physical. They had to have balance. So a lot of the um a lot of the um statues and things that you'll see of the pharaohs, especially from the older kingdoms in Egypt, they would have themselves posed like this, where even just in having this pose, holding the uh flask, which is for whipping. The beast and then the crook, the, the you know, which is basically like a cane with a hook on it, 
that's a more gentler way of subduing the beast, right? Mercy and severity. This is symbolizing balance and also symbolizing mastery over the lower self. And it was so important that they carved it in stone. They carved it in out of metals. They carved it out of precious metals. It was written on everything. And you see that not just in Egypt, but then also in here in some of the older ancient civilizations too, and all over the world. Why? What did I say earlier? We had a worldwide culture. And so the true masters who were still connected to the ancient way of doing things, they balanced the spiritual with the temporal or the physical. The temporal is just the, you know, the secular world, the non-spiritual. Okay? So this government, the United States of America, is just a secular government. They have no say in spiritual matters. All right? But that's not how we did things. Our leaders, our rulers, had to be spiritual leaders as well. They had to be priests. Okay? And even in our unconsciousness, we still have that. Right? We still have it. Like, whenever they go to the leaders of the black community, don't they go find some black preachers to talk to? Why? Because those people, those Moors that don't know who they are, that's how they practice things. Their leaders are the spiritual, you know, the priests and stuff. So they still do it, you know, but they do it to people do it to take advantage of us because we don't know who we are. So we're doing it out of ignorance. <clears throat> but this is how we always did things, right? So there's the, you have to be mastery over the lower self. You can't lead yourself properly. If you can't master your lower self, you are not fit to lead, at least not for a more, a real more. They would never accept that. Okay? And so we're returning to that, to be our higher self, for real. All right? And so... um. Just going back to this, right? So the sultan, okay, was this ruler who um, was not just over the material world, but also spiritually. He has authority in the material and the spiritual world. And so in the Moorish teachings, recognizing the sultan as a ruler, that's reminding us on, of our own responsibility, something that we can apply. Even question 34 can be applied to each and every one of us because it's our responsibility to be sovereign over our own lives in our spiritual journeys. We're not supposed to be on an up and down roller coaster. Things are cool, but then the next minute is crazy and hectic because every, all these teachings that the prophet gave us show us that we create our own problems. We, we are creators, right? Allah never, never made a heaven or a hell. For man, we are creators and making our own fortune. So these weren't just lessons of, oh, Jesus told the people that, you know, just for no reason. No, we're supposed to put it into practice. We are supposed to exercise mastery over our lower self. We're not supposed to be on an up and down roller coaster ride through life. All right. So every more is a ruler in their own right. We all are tasked with maintaining balance and righteousness in our thoughts, actions, and in our community. So on, you know, the individual level, we're supposed to be balanced in our own life. But then also how we interact as a community. Okay. Historically, the Sultan of Morocco has been the political and spiritual leader of the Moroccan people. Now, the present day king of Morocco uh, I think that's Hassan the second. His father did abjugate or did leave the title of Sultan. And so now uh, his son is King of Morocco, but he still symbolically holds that title. Um, the commander of the faithful, right? So he's not just the leader because he does have power over the government, over the, the um, he's not just a symbolic King, he does have power over the army and everything, the Air Force of Morocco, all that stuff. Um, but also, in addition to the physical, right, that title is reflecting that relationship between governing and spirituality. So within any more society, 
our leader is supposed to be like the leaders, like the king of Morocco. He's not supposed to be like this lustful maniac who just trying to sleep with everybody. You know, he getting, you know, diseases and stuff because he's nasty. He's not supposed it's not supposed to be like that. He's supposed to have control over his lower self. Because he's not just the physical king, he's also the commander of the faithful. Right? So that's the role of the sultan in history. All right? So he has to be a Muslim. You know, even though he's not going to put down any religion because he's supposed to have this higher spiritual understanding. So, you know, they, they're not against any religions, right? They're tolerant. <laughs> but also, he's the commander of the faithful, right? So um, at least for Morocco, but it's supposed to be for the whole Muslim world. Right. So that's the role that the Sultan has in history. And so that we understand that the governing systems that we had that was once defined Moorish rule it, in, in one point in time. Right. For thousands of years, Moorish rule was defined by leaders who were seen as both temporal, right, physical and divine representatives. So they did represent they're supposed to represent Allah. They're supposed to make decisions from a lot. They got a decision to make, supposed to meditate, pray on it, right? They're not supposed to be doing things from the lower self. All right. And so that also applies to us. We're supposed to model that. We're supposed to do that same thing. Once again, that comes into that's a problem. I ain't listening to no more, especially claim to be some leader, and they're not even trying to subdue their lower self. And I wouldn't advise you to either. I'm not talking down on anyone, just being real. You you can see the wisdom in that. That's just common sense. This person don't have control over their, over their lower self. They're not even trying. They're fools. Why would you submit to them? Why would you even recognize them? This is not how our, when we were at our heights, this is not how we ruled. This is how we rule now in our lower self, in our fallen state. And others can come and take advantage of us. <clears throat> um, giving more insight into that though the title of sultan right once again that's not just the temporal ruler the physical ruler but that also um, is a spiritual leader It's the sultan is supposed to be the embodiment of balance between material power and spiritual authority and for each and every one of us it's supposed to remind all of us of our dual role as the dual role that we have as moors to govern our own lives with integrity and with wisdom. So we're not just putting it off on the Sultan. Each and every one of us is supposed to mimic that. Okay. And, and we know that everybody's not going to do what they're supposed to, but guess what? We're supposed to have our own forces to police and deal with people who want to be criminals, who want to do foul and get over on people. Right. So we have to exemplify this. So it's, External rule and internal mastery over self. And this is in Islamic tradition, especially in Morocco. The king holds the title Amir al Muminin, and that's the commander of the faithful. That's connected to his role, so his spiritual leadership. And that's the duty to uphold justice and righteousness and to protect and to guide the faith of the people. He's supposed to be able to lead in prayer. Right. He's not just the physical ruler, but also spiritually. Why? Because we always had a priest king maintained by a priesthood. <clears throat> right. When you do that and you don't have all of this corruption and stuff going on, when you do have the corruption going on, it's because they're not actually doing this work. They're not even trying to subdue their lower self. All right. And so the Prophet Noble Drew Ali brought that back. And he's encouraging Moorish Americans to see that reflection, not just in the leaders that we have, but also in our own spiritual journeys. It's supposed to remind each and every one of us that we are commanded to be leaders in faith, right? Leading lives that align with divine principles for each and every one of us. Why? Because we are to uplift fallen humanity. We're not here just to be regular, you know, People that's slaves to sin. We're not supposed to be like that. So the concept is being reiterated there with our leader being a sultan. So our leader, okay, you know, for our nation, yeah, but also on a personal level, 
we're all supposed to be leaders in our own lives. You making your own decisions. We're all making our own decisions. So we're all supposed to exemplify that on a personal level. Sultan, commander of the faith, one and the same. All right. So we got to recognize our own inner authority as spiritual leaders. All right. And reflect or understand our own responsibility, right, in our own spiritual path and also in the paths of others within the community. We have to set the example. We have to exemplify the divine principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. And so that title, Sultan, from a historical perspective, that was used throughout the Moorish world to denote sovereign rulers. In Morocco, that's, you know, now the king of Morocco and the title of commander of the faith. And that title links all the way back to the prophet Muhammad. That's also why the king, uh, I think, Hassan II, that's why he has that title, because by blood, He's connected to the prophet Muhammad. All right. And he's the commander of the faithful. That's what the prophet Muhammad had that title as well. When he was leading the Muslim community, the Ummah. So the king of Morocco, right, is um, inheriting that title as both political ruler and protector of Islam. In general, but especially in Morocco. So it's a living representative of the temporal and spiritual authority, the temporal is specifically the body, the physical world, but he's the both temporal and the spiritual authority. And so remember that, okay, for our leaders, yeah, but also everyone, every question in that questionnaire, everything in the Quran um, is has a spiritual meaning and applies to all of us. We can't put that off on nobody else. <clears throat> Understand everybody doesn't want to do the work. Who cares, right? Most of us need to do this in order for us to truly be successful. So in addition, um, that's, you know, it has a meaning, historical, right? Practical use, though, is in that spiritual lesson, which is that we are all to be, you know, these spiritual and <clears throat> physical leaders, like, you know, in our own lives. We're making decisions, you know, from the higher self. So we're acknowledging that the commander of the faithful, that's, you know, deepening our own understanding of our own connection to this legacy that we have a spiritual and political leadership, right? It's twofold, right? And um, <clears throat> our governments are, you know, connected to our spirituality. We don't separate that stuff, okay? That's what other folks do. And it ain't working. All this stuff is falling apart right in our own faces. Um, Going back in here, too, just to close things out about Northwest of Mexum. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the prophet lets it be known that a Mexum is Africa. So it's Northwest Africa. But we understand that this includes North America. We know this. It's a broader interpretation. And it just goes back to the ancient Moorish presence and influence that extended beyond Africa into what is now considered the Americas. And that is plainly stated. In, in plain English, for everyone to understand, it's stated right there in chapter 47, verses uh, 6 and 7. There can be no mistaking. Their dominion and inhabitation extended, right? So it extended from Northwest Africa across the Great Atlantis, or well, from Northeast and Northwest Africa, across the Great Atlantis, until the present North, South, Central America, Mexico, and the Atlantis Islands before the Great Earthquake, which caused the Atlantic Ocean. We're given a time frame, too. This took place thousands of years ago before that Atlantic Ocean was created. <laughs> now, not millions of years ago, but thousands. And if they came over here, settled, inhabited, this is their dominion, not just where they live. And so now by coming back into this, reclaiming who we are, you know, eventually it's going to be more than just something that we claim. We are going to have control and dominion. But first, we have to come back in and, and really embody the principles that we're supposed to be standing on. Because otherwise, you know, we are just pretenders, right? Anyone could call us out and prove that we're not who we say we are. <clears throat> but, um, you know, that, you know there's, there's no mistake in that. Then the prophet let it be known that Northwest Africa, Northwest of Mexico, extended over here. 
right? So it was there and it's here. We're connected to both. Extended beyond Africa into what is now considered the Americas. And so, you know, now coming into this, we have divine inheritance of the land because wherever Moorish people reside, we carry that wisdom and authority of our ancestors. And so that concept of Northwest America that covers Northwest Africa and North America, and this is a reminder to Moorish Americans, we are a part of a global heritage. The prophet's teachings are encouraging us to see ourselves as inheritors of divine wisdom and is not confined to borders and to you know, recognize our responsibility now to live in harmony under the principles of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, whether in Africa or America, right? But he let it be known it, it happened, you know, when they could just walk over here before that earthquake was caused that. So we're not stuck with these borders. These borders and stuff, most of these borders are man-made. That doesn't affect us. <clears throat> we understand our connection, okay? That's why I'm saying I'm sticking with the prophet because sticking with the prophet I can actually trace myself back through time. Now I can understand the things that were left out of the history books, but it's actually been found over here and covered up. All right. So historically, yeah, Northwest of Mexico refers to North Africa, right? Modern day Morocco, Mauritania, Algeria, Tunisia, right? That was the center historically of more civilization, especially during the height of the Moroccan empire. But we know that the ancient Moors, even dating back to when they were called the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, that they were known for this trade, the influence they had over trade and culture. So we knew that with great um, maritime, you know, had mastered sailing. And so now we understand that also has significance for the Americas, especially North America, right? <clears throat> And we know that the Moors inhabited the Americas long before European colonization. And so that understanding is crucial for us to have so that there's no confusion, right? It's not about separating it. Oh, it was all over here. No, we understand it was connected. We understand that trade was taking place. We understand the ancestors even created the Niger River, right? We understand they created the Nile River, <coughs> right? So now we can trace ourselves back and understand it wasn't the result of slavery or colonization. It's a reclaiming of our ancestral homeland, right? So Northwest Africa and, and the Americas are connected. That term of Mexum highlights our historical presence and who we are, you know, our, our own sovereignty in both continents. But, you know, right now we're out of place. We have to just come in and start to reassert ourselves build up our own communities, right? Take control of our own neighborhoods, right? Begin to be who we really are, right? Reconnect with our identity. Then we can assert our rightful place as citizens in the world, right? But we have to be, you know, rooted in our spiritual and historical truth. We have to actually be who we are, all right? And, um, just lastly, that Northwest of Mexico has dual meaning for us. It was left ambiguous for a reason. The prophet emphasized our connection to the Afri to the Americas and to Africa. So that highlights that we're not limited by geographical boundaries. We have a divine inheritance and it spans continents. So we have a global identity and a global unity, and there's actually inter, we're interconnected with all Moors, where, wherever they are, whether th throughout the Americas or throughout Africa. We're connected to both. All right, the prophet wanted us to see ourselves in a broader, more interconnected way, right? We actually have more allies in the world than you may think that we have. And then also just uh, lastly, that title, that commander of the faithful, not only is that for our rulers, right? The sultan, right? A spiritual and temporal ruler. But also, this is leadership roles that we all have to take on personally, 
even if it's just you, you live by yourself, you don't mess with nobody, you don't talk to nobody else, you still have to have a leadership role in your own life. So this is for us to take on personally and then also in our communities so that we're guiding ourselves and also guiding others towards righteousness and truth. Okay, and righteousness and truth, that's like the opposite of what's being pushed and promoted to our people. Through the music, the culture, all of that stuff is is it's the opposite. So now we're recognizing we're descendants of the Moors of Northwest and Mexico. That encompasses both Africa and the Americas. And this is us reclaiming our noble birthright to live in the um alignment with divine principles. So anyone want, can I lead this? I don't really want to join the temple. Yeah, fine, do you, but like keeping it real. I don't know if I want to see what you're gonna do. What you're gonna create is gonna be scary. You're gonna be trying to sleep with everybody's woman. Or if you're a woman, you're gonna be trying to get pregnant by a bunch of dudes. You're gonna be doing a whole bunch of stuff that we wanna cut out. We wanna do a better job now. We wanna do it for real. So you you know, no, you can't leave this out. You can do whatever you want, but we're not trying to leave this out. Islam, and um, that's really just all I wanted to say. I, I hope this makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I do feel the holy zeal, you know, and I, I do believe this is real. And what the prophet brought to us is really for our earthly and divine salvation. This is not a game, Morris. So I just wanted to lay that out. And um, on that note, <clears throat> I yield the floor to any questions or comments, Morris. Please feel free to speak. There's no judgment. Nobody's, you know, looking down on anyone. But, you know, their opinions, their, you know, feelings, thoughts. So please feel free to speak. And on that note, I yield the floor. Islam. All right, Islam, there, if there's no questions or comments, we're going to go ahead and go into the closing of the meeting. Uh, let's read our divine warning. A divine warning by the prophet for the nations. The citizens of all free national governments, according to their national constitution, are all of one family bearing one free national name. Those who fail to recognize the free national name of their constitutional government are classed as undesirables and are subject to all inferior names and abuses and mistreatments that the citizens care to bestow upon them. And it is a sin for any group of people to violate the national constitutional laws of a free national government and cling to the names and the principles that delude to slavery. I, the prophet, was prepared by the great God, Allah, to warn my people to repent from their sinful ways and go back to the state of mind, to their forefathers' divine and national principles, that they will be law abiders and receive their divine right as citizens according to the free national constitution that was prepared for all free national beings. They are to claim their own free national name and religion. There is but one issue for them to be recognized by this government and of the earth, and it comes only through the connection of the Moorish Divine National Movement, which is incorporated in this government and recognized by all other nations of the world. And through it, they and their children can receive their divine rights, unmolested by other citizens, that they can cast a free national ballot at the polls under the free national constitution of the state's government and not under a granted privilege, as has been the existing condition for many generations. You who doubt whether I, the prophet, and my principles are right for the redemption of my people, go to those that know the law, in the city hall, and among the officials in your government, and ask them under an intelligent tone, and they will be glad to render you a favorable reply. 
for they are glad to see me bring you out of darkness into light. Money doesn't make the man. It is free national standards and power that makes a man and a nation. The wealth of all national governments, gold and silver and commerce, belong to the citizens alone. And without your national citizenship, by name and principles, you have no true wealth. And I am hereby calling on all true citizens that stand for a national free government and the enforcement of the Constitution to help me in my great missionary work because I need all support from all true American citizens of the United States of America. Help me to save my people who have fallen from the constitutional laws of the government. I am depending on your support to get them back to the constitutional fold again, that they will learn to love instead of hate and will live according to love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, supporting our free national constitution of the United States of America. I love my people and I desire their unity and mine back to their own free national and divine standard because day by day they have been violating the national and constitutional laws of their government by claiming names and principles that are unconstitutional. If Italians, Greeks, English, Chinese, Japanese, Turks, and Arabians are forced to proclaim their free national name and religion before the constitutional government of the United States of America it is no more than right that the law should be enforced upon all other American citizens alike. In all other governments, when a man is born and raised there and asks for his national descent name and if he fails to give it, he is misused, imprisoned, or exiled. Any group of people that fail to answer up to the constitutional standards of law by name and principles, because to be a citizen of any government, you must claim your national descent name, because they place their trust upon issue and names formed by their forefathers. The word Negro deludes in the Latin language to the word nigger, the same as the word colored deludes to anything that is painted, varnished, and dyed. And every nation must bear a national descent name of their forefathers, because honoring thy fathers and thy mothers, your days will be lengthened upon this earth. These names have never been recognized by any true American citizens of this day. Through your free national name, you are known and recognized by all nations of the earth that are recognized by said national government in which they live. The 14th and 15th Amendments brought the North and South in unit, placing the Southerners, who were at that time without power, with the constitutional body of power. And at that time, 1865, the free national constitutional law that was enforced since 1774 declared all men equal and free. And if all men are declared by the free national constitution to be free and equal, since that constitution has never been changed, there is no need for the application of the 14th and 15th amendments for the salvation of our people and citizens. So there isn't but one supreme issue for my people to use to redeem that which was lost. And that is through the above statements. Then the lion and the lamb can lie down together in yonder hills and neither will be harmed because love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice will be reigning in this land. In those days, the United States will be one of the greatest civilized and prosperous governments of the world. But if the above principles are not carried out by the citizens and my people in this government, the worst is yet to come. Because the great God of the universe is not pleased with the works that are being performed in North America by my people, and this great sin must be removed from the land to save it from enormous earthquakes, disease etc and i the prophet do hear and believe that this administration of the government being more wisely prepared by more genius citizens that believe in their free national constitution and laws and through the help of such classes of citizens i the prophet truly believe that my people will find the true and divine way of their forefathers and learn to stop serving carnal customs and merely ideas of man that have never done them any good but have always harmed them. So I, the prophet, am hereby calling aloud with a divine plea to all true American citizens to help me to remove this great sin which has been committed and is being practiced by my people in the United States of America because they know it is not the true and divine way and without understanding they have fallen from the true light into utter darkness of sin. 
And there is not a nation on earth today that will recognize them socially, religiously, politically, or economically, ETC, in their present condition of their endeavorment in which they themselves try to force upon a civilized world. They will not refrain from their sinful ways of action and their deeds have brought Jim Crowism, segregation, and everything that brings harm to human beings on earth. And they fought the Southerner for all these great misuses, but I have traveled in the South and have examined conditions there, and it is the works of my people continuously practicing the things which bring dishonor, disgrace, and disrespect to any nation that lives the life. And I am hereby calling on all true American citizens for moral support and finance to help me in my great missionary work to bring my people out of darkness into marvelous light. From the Prophet. All right, Islam Moors, we will now go into the closing of the meeting. Um, having already read our rich and divine warning, I just want to put the call out there for anyone who would like to assist us in the great work of uplifting fallen humanity. Um, you can always send a donation to us. Uh, just go to the website, moorishamericans.com. Uh, if you just go to our website, you can always just scroll down to the bottom and use the um, the uh, donate button on there to send a donation to our temple. <clears throat> Once again, that's MoorishAmericans.com. Just scroll down to the bottom and use that donate button to send a donation to the temple. Um, you can also, if for anyone is ready to join and proclaim your nationality, just click that contact button on there. You can use the phone number or fill out that contact form to reach out to us. And, um, you know, ask any questions that you have. But we will need to talk with you and um, possible meet up with you first. And uh, that is all for today, Morris. Uh, let's go ahead and close out. All meetings are to be open and closed promptly according to the Circle 7 in love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. I want to ask <clears throat> all members to please stand and face the east as we recite the closing prayer. Okay, standing facing the east with our heels together, feet at a 45 degree angle, holding up two fingers on the right and five on the left. Allah, bind our hearts and minds back to our ancient forefathers, divine creed and principles. We ask this in thy holy name and the seven Elohim. Amen. Islam, peace and love. More as this meeting is now adjourned. Islam, family, peace and love. Peace, 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 peace.